Thanks for joining us today to learn a bit more about multiple sclerosis. I'm Andrea Salmon and I'm your presenter today. I'm an occupational therapist and have been working with MS for over 15 years. I'm currently the Education Program Manager. During today's session we're going to look at three broad areas. What is multiple sclerosis? We'll have a look at the symptoms and the holistic management of those symptoms and we'll also have a look at ways to support your residents. These are the learning outcomes for today and I hope you feel that by the end of the session you've learned a lot more about multiple sclerosis. So let's start with what is multiple sclerosis. Now I'm sure you already know a lot about MS, so let's see if what I tell you matches what you already know. So multiple sclerosis is a chronic autoimmune disease that affects the central nervous system. And in varying degrees it interferes with the transmission of nerve impulses throughout the brain the spinal cord and the optic nerves which make up the central nervous system. In MS the immune system which usually works to protect the body mistakenly starts to attack the body's own tissue in the central nervous system. It starts to attack the, 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 the tissue known as myelin and there's no clear cause for what starts that and there's currently no cure. MS. When a person has MS, the myelin sheath, sheath becomes inflamed, the nerve fibre itself can also be damaged and as I said the, in, the signals can be interrupted. So the myelin is a fatty white substance that actually covers the axons throughout the central nervous system. In that picture on the slide the, the myelin is depicted as that white material covering the yellow axon. The myelin actually helps the messages travel fast and efficiently around the central nervous system. And in MS it's the myelin sheath that gets attacked and becomes inflamed and can, can recover but can leave areas of the axon exposed and then the axon itself can become um, irreparably damaged because the, the nerves in the central nervous system don't repair once they're broken. The myelin however has a degree of recovery that can happen during the disease process. The disease is called multiple sclerosis because it's multiple in time and multiple in place so as in it, it occurs in different places within the central nervous system and sclerosis is a Greek word for scar. The diagnosis of MS can actually be quite challenging. So if you talk to your residents or clients who have multiple sclerosis, sometimes it's been quite a lengthy process of diagnosis. Because what the, what the clinicians are looking for are changes over time and changes in different places and they also want to exclude other conditions that might have a similar clinical picture. So a good example of that, one of the early symptoms of MS for some people could be an episode of tingling, numbness, pins and needles in their hands. Now there could be a whole lot of reasons why someone might have tingling pins and needles in their hand. You could have a chat amongst yourselves about what some of those reasons would be. Sometimes it could be a pinched nerve, sometimes it could be carpal tunnel syndrome. There could be a, a whole range of reasons why they might have that experience and through the form in MS it usually resolves after a period of time and the, the doctor, the GP might just note that in their history. Another early sign of MS can be, and it's not always telling you that it's MS, but an episode of optic neuritis where someone goes to their GP with a period of double vision. Again, there could be a whole lot of reasons why people have optic neuritis, certainly not always MS. So the diagnosis of MS tends to be an exclusion of other conditions. 
And an MRI is one of the key tools that the, the clinicians use to diagnose MS. So they're looking for areas of fluid uptake. It's very helpful to have the red arrows on the slide, um, but that these are the areas that the neurologist is looking for. And they will most likely ask people to have a couple of MRIs with a space in between, so three months, six months, something like that, because they're wanting to see changes on those MRIs. If it was exactly the same, that's not actually indicating MS. There are other reasons why there are these areas of fluid uptake. So when we start thinking about who gets MS, MS is actually a disease that's predominantly a disease of women, as are many other autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes, thyroid disease. MS isn't a notifiable condition, therefore accurate numbers aren't really available. We go by estimates from the census and we go by the numbers of people that we have registering with us as an organisation, but again that's not everybody. So we anticipate that there could be about 25,000 Australians living with multiple sclerosis. And about 1 in 20 Australians will be directly impacted either through a diagnosed family member, friend or colleague. So it is quite likely that everyone knows someone with MS. And in your situation, you're, you might be working with someone with MS, but you might also know someone personally with MS as well. And those people will have a very different experience. The people that we find we're working with in residential settings or in care settings tend to have had their MS for a long time. And we'll get on in a little while to talk about medications. But that disease duration is significant in the support that was available then and the support that's available for people who are diagnosed now. So when we think about the influencing factors, remember I said before there's no clear cause. There's a lot of things that influence whether or not a person develops MS, but there's no clear cause. So the things that we know about are genetic predisposition. MS seems to run in some families, but it's not a genetic condition. If it was a truly con genetic condition, it would be passed down from generation to generation, and that doesn't happen. When we look at twin studies, it doesn't necessarily mean that both people in a pair of twins have developed MS. One might, the other doesn't necessarily, which they would if it was a truly genetic condition. So there seems to be a genetic predisposition. There's also an environmental trigger, and I'll talk about that in a minute. There's also a whole lot of question marks. There's things like uh, exposure to certain viruses that seems to be more prevalent in MS. Other factors that really just go to the picture of why a person might develop MS. But as I said, it's not a clear connecting contributing factor. They're all influencing factors. And when we look at the environmental one, this one's really quite interesting. This map shows you the prevalence of MS. And the areas that are red are actually the highest risk areas of developing MS. I would hasten to add that large areas of, of Europe, particularly um, what was previously uh, Russia, there's not a lot of information known from those areas. So they're in the probable high risk. But you can see there that there's quite a, they call it a, a latitudinal effect. There's a high prevalence the further you move away from the equator. And the closer you are to the equator, the lower your risk is. Now you might have been a, a step ahead of me for what might be the contributing factor in that. And if you said sunlight, you were right on the money. The further away from the equator, there's less sunlight hours, far more sunlight hours around the equator. So there seems to be a direct connection with sunlight, with vitamin D, and a lot of research going into that area. Not sufficient to perhaps necessarily say, well, let's just make sure we're all out in the sun. Not quite that clear, but 
there's a connect with. So let's pause for a minute and I'm going to get you to pause the recording and have a discussion amongst yourselves around life roles of a woman in her 30s. So we've just established that MS is more prevalent in women and the average age of diagnosis is in the 30s. So what are women in their 30s doing? So pause the recording and have a brainstorm amongst yourselves. If you came up with a list like this, you're doing really well. You could have perhaps filled a whiteboard. A woman in her 30s is undertaking so many things in their life. Depends on the individual, of course, but so many things make up a 30-year-old's life. And, and these are just some of them, really. But I hope you've got some of these. We'll come back to this shortly. So put that, that brainstorm to the side but be ready to come back to it as well. Let's go on now and have a look at the types of multiple sclerosis. The majority of people have a form of MS that gets the name relapsing remitting. So these labels are put on actually after a person has been diagnosed, not usually at the point of diagnosis and certainly not before, but after a person has been diagnosed and the clinicians can look back and, and so, well, your type of MS seems to be relapsing remitting because you're having episodes, you're having attacks, you're having relapses, and then you're having periods of recovery and that, that, that remission sign. That seems to be the predominant sort of MS. And a num another group of people develop an MS that's called primary progressive, and that isn't marked by relapses, that just seems to have disease progression over time. A very small percentage of people have a type of MS that's called progressive relapsing, so they have a bit of both. And the one in there that's called secondary progressive, that tends to be what we see when someone has had MS for a number of years. Can't quite predict, but maybe about 15 years, but that, that's just, you know, give or take. That's when a, a person notices that they're no longer having the marked relapses that they were, but over time their disease has progressed, their disability has increased. By and large, and it's not 100%, but by and large we would say that people who find themselves living in residential care have probably had their multiple sclerosis for a long period of time and they are most likely to have moved into a secondary progressive phase of their MS. This next slide actually demonstrates the variability of MS. So as I've said, there are different types. There's also different rates of progression. What you would have noticed is missing on that last slide was any time measurement around a person's disability. And that's quite on purpose. If you're looking at a, a condition that is naturally progressive, you would imagine, uh, sorry, I should go back a step. This, the scale on this graph, you've got disease duration across the bottom, and up the left-hand side, you've got a measure of disability. So it's called the expanded disability status scale, but it's a measure of disability. In a truly natural progressive disease, you would imagine that everybody would sit along the line that's shown on that graph. So the longer you've had the disease, the higher your measurement of disability would be, as shown on that line. All those dots on that graph actually represent people living with MS who were part of this study back in 2008. So you've got people in that study, people on that graph, that have had their MS for 35 years, but their, their measure of their disability is only 1.5. That's minimal disability. And you've also, in contrast, got people who are scoring 8.5 on their disability scale, having only had MS for five years, and that's a high degree of disability. 
that is very, very impaired mobility. That's likely to be wheelchair bound, great difficulty transferring. So all those dots represent different people and where they fit in how long they've had the disease and what their score of disability is. It's really just there as a visual reminder that everybody is different and the disease is so variable. So this list starts to show us the symptoms that someone with MS might experience. Now of course it depends on where the disease activity is happening in their brain or spinal cord, what symptoms might show up and it's certainly not a shopping list. We often show this list to clients and we will strongly remind them that they might only ever have one or two of these symptoms, that someone else might actually have a lot of these symptoms. And a bit like we saw on the last slide, the variability is such that it's very unlikely to have two people with exactly the same symptom mix. A whole lot of variation goes on. I'm hoping that those all make sense to you. I'll come back to some of those in a bit more detail in a little while. But uh, if you need to look up any of those symptoms, you can get onto our website, ms.org.au, and have a look for more detail about those symptoms. Ask, ask each other, have a conversation. Do you know about those symptoms? Do they make sense to you? Hopefully they're, they're all you know, reasonably easily understood. I would, however, get you to stop again now and go back to that list of life roles that you had earlier in the presentation when you brainstormed life roles and start to have a think about the impact of those symptoms that we saw on the last slide on the life roles that a person living with MS might be endeavouring to, to have, to the, the things that they're trying to do in their life, how those symptoms might impact them. Pause the recording now and have a chat amongst yourselves. I hope that you came up with a real variety of impact because it is a real variety of impact. The impact is going to vary. For some people the impact is minimal but for others the impact is extreme. And that very much depends on the individual circumstances. So I'll give you a couple of examples. If you had someone who was experiencing some changes to their balance, so their mobility was a bit affected, but largely it was their balance that was a bit off. If they had an office job, if they were working, you know, sitting down all day, their balance is probably not going to have a huge impact. But alternately, if you had someone and their role was a builder and they were working on large buildings on scaffolding way above the ground, their balance is in incredibly important. And in fact, poor balance might mean that they can't carry out their job anymore. Similarly, if we use another example and have a think about cognitive change, so some degree of maybe memory loss, maybe a bit, um, maybe thought processing is a bit slower than it was before. If you've got someone whose role is uh, perhaps labouring or gardening, that might not have a big impact. They might still actually be able to carry out their job quite well with not much impact. But if you've got someone like we did have a client a few years back whose job was calculating the odds at the TAB, we want them to be fully on the game with their, their thought processes, their speed of thinking. So again, they're just examples of how the impact can vary from person to person. The impact can vary depending on the individual circumstances. And it can affect all those areas shown on the slide. So it's important to have a think about what the impact has been for your resident, for the people that you're working with. What symptoms does your resident experience? When do you become aware of their symptoms? And how are they different from other residents? It can be good, and if you want to, stop the recording again and have a chat about that, but it can be really good to think about the impact for individuals of their MS on their life. 
Were they expecting to live in residential care at this age? Were they expecting to still be working? Did they think they'd have to give up driving? Did they anticipate moving away from their family? Just have a little reflection on those kind of questions. When we talk about treating and managing MS, there are a whole lot of things we want people to take into account. There's the medical management, of course, and there's management of symptoms, and the two are not necessarily um, bunched together. They are separate. We need to think about managing the disease process, and we need to think separately about managing the symptoms that a person is experiencing. So a person needs regular review of their symptoms, of their disease, and of all the other things that are going on for them in life. It's not just MS that might be impacting their ability to manage. It might not be just MS that's having an impact on their health. They're not immune from other things going on. So they need a really wide network of professional support and that varies from time to time. But different people looking at different things. And of course, we would very much encourage all the regular health promotion activities to improve quality of life, whether it's a, having an impact on their MS symptoms or an impact on other life factors. We all need to be paying attention to the whole gamut of health issues that we can be facing at different times throughout our life. When we come to disease management, there are a number of medications that are now available. We used to list them, but they're changing so quickly, we can't do that anymore. There are so many more options for people to consider when they're thinking of medications that might alter the disease course for them. And they vary from the injections that have been around now for um, over 25 years through to infusions and oral medications that are constantly coming on the market and onto the PBS as viable options for people to consider when they're new, newly diagnosed. And again, that's why you see a very different picture for the people that you know personally versus the people that you might be working with in your facility. And there's a little asterisk there because there's also medications available for relapses tends to be steroid treatment to help dampen the inflammatory process that happens in a relapse, but there, that's also important to remember. So just a recap as we finish this section. The symptoms of multiple sclerosis vary from person to person, and they certainly vary for the individual over time as well. So as you would anticipate, individualised support should be offered to everybody. So no two people are the same, they shouldn't be treated and supported in the same way. It needs to be individual to the person so that they can live well with the disease. If you would like any more information about any of the things that we've just talked about, please head to the website and have a read, find some resources, find some more information, some fact sheets, some handouts that accompany this module and, and read up as much as you're interested and can. So let's move on and have a think about the symptoms and management strategies. Now again, I'm going to go over these in very broad brush strokes. So I'll be touching on them quite quickly. I would really like you to then take that information and apply it in your situation, in your setting and for the people that you're working with who are living with MS. And just as I've said, if, there, if you would like more detailed information, by all means contact MS Connect or check out information on the website. So just a recap again of the symptoms that a person might be experiencing. Depending on where the damage occurs in the central nervous system, you're, you might come across people who are experiencing cognitive impairment, depression, coordination problems or tremor, weakness, spasticity, bowel or bladder problems, sexual problems, blurred or double vision, maybe vision loss, vision problems that then might affect vertigo, balance, speech disorders, swallowing disorders, maybe sensory loss or pain, 
And then across the board we've got people experiencing fatigue and heat sensitivity. Now as we said, that varies from time to time and varies from person to person. But these are all the types of things that you might expect to see in someone living with multiple sclerosis. The literature tells us that 80% of people with MS will actually put fatigue as one of their top three symptoms. Now that's fatigue in addition to everyday fatigue. So we all know what it's like to be tired. But people with MS have a couple of different experiences of fatigue on top of that natural fatigue. So lassitude is a name given to an overwhelming type of fatigue that doesn't match anything that the person's been doing. So they might have been actually just having a really quiet day, but come two o'clock they just can't do anything more. They feel like they've been hit by a truck, they feel like they've hit the wall and they can't go on. Lassitude is the name for that type of fatigue. Another type of fatigue that people with MS experience is very much related to the damaged nerve fibres. So it gets the name nerve fibre fatigue, neuromuscular fatigue and tends to be seen more commonly in physical activities but it also applies to cognitive activities. And classic examples are things like, you can start off walking around the block quite fine, no problem at all. Halfway around the block, one foot starts to drag. It's like the damaged nerves have trouble repeatedly firing to perform that activity. And once they get tired, they don't perform that activity properly. So if the person that's walking around the block then sits and has a rest on a fence for a while, they're most likely to get up and be back walking properly. So that nerve just needs that recovery time to get back to full function. So people see it very readily in physical activities that are repetitive in nature. Walking, household activities, writing, um, typing on the computer, anything that's repetitive in nature is very obvious. Less obvious but still occurring is the same fatigue for cognitive activities. So most of our cognitive activities are also repetitive in nature. Reading, concentrating, decision making, talking even. These are all processes that require the same nerves to fire over and over. And if it's those nerves that are damaged, you're likely to see a drop off in the performance of those activities. And that's nerve fibre fatigue. What do we do about it? So if you have a resident who is experiencing fatigue, there are some ways that you can assist them to manage that symptom. The suggestions we would make are things like pacing activities, giving them good rest breaks, maintaining a cooler environment. I'll talk about heat intolerance in a bit, but a cooler environment is actually really helpful for someone who's living with multiple sclerosis. Sounds like double duck, but we encourage exercise as a way of managing fatigue. So rather than a person with MS fatigue always resting, they need regular rest breaks, but they actually need to be engaged in activity and exercise to maintain their strength and their fitness. Hydration is really important because even a, a minimal amount of dehydration will add to the person's experience of fatigue. And you've also got to take into account things like a person's iron levels, other reasons why they might be feeling fatigued. And we also want to maintain a person's sleep quality. If we're thinking then about maintaining good sleep for people with multiple sclerosis, there are some ways that you can assist your resident to improve their sleep if they're having and experiencing poor sleep. Often that can be around routine, making sure that there's a, a, quite a distinction between daytime activities and evening activities that wind them down. With our kids, it's things like getting into their pajamas, reading in bed rather than being up playing. The same sort of thing applies as we get older. We need to have some distinction between this is daytime activity and now we're into nighttime activity. 
Light is really important in helping maintain the sleep and wake cycle or in, in the other way around, the wake and sleep cycle. We want light coming into our eyes in the morning to dampen our melatonin and then during the day that melatonin builds again, ready for sleep that night. So if we've got people who aren't getting out into the daylight in the morning, their melatonin might not be dropping. So they're, they're, they're not getting that cycle that's helping them to sleep well. So we want to avoid light in the evenings as well. That this might not be an issue for you, but we find it's an issue for a lot of our younger folk who might have their TV or their computer screen in their bedroom, on their lap, maybe for their laptop. And so that's giving them false light, that's dampening their melatonin and not helping them sleep at night. There might be other factors for someone not sleeping well like caffeine and also other symptoms such as bladder, bladder symptoms that might be getting them up and disturbing their sleep overnight. So appropriate referral even for sleep disturbances can be really important. Your resident might be experiencing spasticity, so how might you assist in managing this symptom? You might need to review their medications, the timing and the dosage, particularly if they are on medications for spasticity. That might just need a review. Perhaps they need to see a physio and be, um, be assessed for a stretching and positioning program, a, a program of stretches that might reduce their spasticity and a set of positions that doesn't bring on the spasticity. Might also need to review pressure risks if a person is spending a lot of time sitting. And interestingly, it's important to manage constipation because constipation can have a direct impact on a person's um, experience of spasms. If your resident is experiencing pain or altered sensation, there are some things that you can do as well. It's really important to be aware that pain is quite a common symptom of MS and it actually can be quite complex and difficult to manage. So if you are working with someone who's experiencing pain, it needs a really thorough assessment. They, we need to work out whether that pain is acute, something has happened suddenly that's caused that pain, or whether in fact that's um, a chronic pain that they're experiencing and might be related to the, the nerve damage rather than some uh, incident or episode that will recover. So medications might need to be prescribed to help manage that pain once the, the GP has been able to work out what type of pain it is that they're experiencing. If it is that neuropathic pain, unfortunately there's not a lot that can be done about that. So we start thinking about behaviour modifications to help manage that pain. Cognitive restructuring, gentle activity maybe or distraction. And we think about monitoring posture and constantly being aware of pressure risk. Even if the, the pain is determined to be neuropathic, therefore not a lot can be done medically to manage it even more important to keep monitoring the risk for pressure. <clears throat> if your resident is experiencing bladder or bowel changes, again there are some things that you can do to assist with that. The first one, even though I've listed the first one as assessment, it, it might even be pre-assessment. It can be working out what's going on. So many people it might be obvious in your setting, but so many people fail to speak up about their bladder changes or changes in their bowel habits. So if that's determined as something that could be going on, assessment is really important. The neuropathic bladder or the, the neurogenic bladder is quite an interesting bladder. I'm not a nurse by background, but they tell me it's a, because it's, it's a muscle, the, the, mus the nerve um, supply to the bladder can cause it to become what they call a twitchy bladder. So really thorough assessment needs to be made. 
People with MS might be experiencing urinary incontinence or urinary urgency. They might actually have a failure to fully empty their bladder and an ability to pass urine. So that, that it, they could, we could find they've got residual urine in their bladder that's setting up that feeling that they need to go again. So it's important to work out what's going on so that it can be managed properly, not just put down to, oh, they're being difficult or you know they, they just want the attention. There could actually be a physiological reason that they're calling so often for um, to go to the toilet. For bowel issues, it could be um, constipation or it could be diarrhea. It can be all manner of changes that occur because of the changes to the nerve supply to the bladder or bowel. So once you've had an assessment, it might be that a, a good routine needs to be established. That might that will include diet and fluid, and it might also include medication. It's so important to get this right. People who are self-managing their bladder problems are probably not drinking, so that they feel that that will stop them going to the toilet, but actually it can be setting up the wrong messages and sending them to the toilet more often. Now I mentioned before this, this experience of heat sensitivity. For, for all of us, our, our nerves don't work so well when they're hot. So when we have a stretch of hot days, everybody tends to flag. And that's because our nerves aren't working so well. For people with MS, that temperature intolerance tends to happen at a much lower temperature. So we have people who tell us they know when the temperature gets to 24 degrees because their symptoms that were quite in control before suddenly become a bit out of control and they notice that their symptoms are all worse. So it, it can cause a, what they call a pseudo relapse. So a, a marked increase in symptoms to the point where the person feels they're having a relapse. It's not a relapse. They'll recover from those symptoms when their temperature goes down. And that heat sensitivity can be caused from, by a number of um, changes to heat. So it can be the obvious ones that are around the temperature of the day or maybe the heating in the room, that type of temperature. It can also be exercising and building up their own core temperature. And I know we said we want them to exercise, so I'll come to that in a minute. It can also be a sign that they might be running a temperature. So if their core temperature goes up because they're running, they've got a fever, that would also be a signal uh, or signalled by an increase in their symptoms. So what can you do about it? Well, the first one might be planning activities for earlier in the day or later in the day when it's cooler. That's a good strategy. But it can also be the use of chill vests or cooling neckties. All those products that people wear to help keep themselves cool and maintain their core temperature. There are lots of these available and MS Connect would be happy to send you in the right direction. It could be as simple as cotton clothing rather than synthetic clothing to help keep a person cool. And whereas most older people like to have the temperature warmer, that warmer temperature might be adding to the person with MS's experience of their symptoms. It's worth a conversation, finding out if it does make a difference for them and if we need to put in steps to reduce the impact. So weakness is the next one. If weakness is an issue for your resident, how do you assist with that one? Well, again, it's really important to provide appropriate seating and uh, support during transfers. You might actually need a review by an OT or a physio of equipment that might, might be required. The physio might actually be able to prescribe a course of exercise, a program that might look at minim, with increasing strength, basically, minimising weakness but increasing strength. Now, that sounds very grand and it might be minimal changes, but it doesn't mean those changes can't occur. People with MS can participate very appropriately and with great results in an, a, str a strengthening program. So don't dismiss that. Encourage exercise wherever possible. 
And of course, if a person's experiencing weakness in their swallowing, in their, the muscles of their throat, it's really important to get a speech therapy review so that we um, eliminate any problems that can be caused by coughing and choking. The next area we're going to have a look at is cognitive change in MS. Now, it, it can be quite difficult to see cognitive change or for some people it looks really obvious. But cognitive change occurs in about 50% of people who are living with multiple sclerosis. And if it occurs, it's most likely to be seen as reduced attention or concentration and reduced thinking speed. So whereas we might be able to juggle a whole lot of information at once, that becomes really challenging for a person with cognitive change. Processing a number of things at a time is, is nigh on impossible. So if you think about, if you think about slowing down a task, and a good one is writing your name, you can write your name without even thinking about it. But if you had to write your name, by thinking about each letter individually and really slowly at a pace like I'm speaking now, that would really slow down your ability to write your name. And that can be an example of how a person's thinking speed is impacted. It's taking them so much longer to not only comprehend what's been said to them, but process it and then come up with an answer. Yet often we're expecting an answer straight away. So reduced thinking speed can have a huge impact. The cognitive change could also be seen as reduced memory and new learning. So bringing in a new piece of equipment, bringing in a new procedure for how you do a transfer could be really challenging for someone. And then there can be things like reduced initiation of activity and problem solving ability. So they said they were going to do it, they agreed to it, and yet they haven't done it. That's potentially a reduced initiation of activity. And also another really frustrating one, which is reduced flexibility and insight. Very challenging when we're working with people day in, day out, to be, to be working with someone with reduced flexibility and insight. So what do we do about it? We try, wherever possible, to overcome the limitations that we see in the person that we're working with. So we need to implement management strategies such as visual aids, whiteboards, journal, diary, visitors books, those kind of things. So rather than expecting someone to commit something to memory, we pop it up on the whiteboard or we write it in the diary. We really need consistent routine reliable teamwork, go back to your care plan, you know, make sure the care plan provides the routine and just do it. It's actually more boring for us as staff members than it is for the residents. They like that routine and consistency. It's us that get a bit bored with it and try to mix it up a little bit. Facilitate communication. You will have already done this. Knowing your resident and knowing where they've come from goes a long way to understanding their, their inflexibility or their, their, the difficulty that they're having with new ideas. And responding appropriately to, be, to behaviours of concern and conflict. Knowing what pushes your buttons, knowing what pushes the residents' buttons and working proactively to reduce that. Look for the residents' strengths and abilities. Build on those. Encourage them to do the things that they can do. Provide choice where choice is possible possible and do everything you can to improve their quality of life. Great strategies and there's some handouts there that are included in the handout out pack to assist with this. We, we've got to remember the impact of mood and emotions for people living with MS. Sometimes this can be brought, around, brought about by the change in the nervous system but it can be around uncertainty about the future. Anxiety, stress and fear, grief and sadness, a vulnerability and a loss of control that comes across so often for people with MS. That can lead to anger and irritability, depression. A lot of people with MS experience episodes of depression, let alone mood swings. 
So a lot to take into account, a lot for you to consider, but really, really important things when you're considering how best to support your resident. So again, I would just say at the end of that section, if there's more information you would like on any of those symptoms, head to the website or check out the handouts that we've included and even a call to MS Connect to find out a bit more where to find information. So let's move on to thinking about best ways to support your resident. And we have actually touched on some of these already, you'll see. So what we'd encourage you to first off think about is the losses that the person you're working with has experienced. Have they experienced, they certainly if they're living in residential care, have had losses around physical independence and self-care. They might have lost the, the ability to make decisions, including financial and health decisions. Maybe they can't make those decisions or maybe those decisions have been taken out of their control. Highly likely they've lost their employment, whether that came at a natural time that they were expecting retirement or whether they had to give up work earlier. There's probably been an impact on relationships, let alone a potential very early impact on intimacy. We mentioned before we're, we're talking about people in their 30s who are diagnosed with MS, a very key age where relationships and intimacy is so important. But what's been the impact of MS for them? Did it have an impact on their relationship? Did it have an impact on their, for their partner? Then yeah, there's the practical things like driving ability, social functioning and all the leisure activities, all the things that they might have anticipated doing at the age they are now and perhaps they're not doing them. So we really need to have a flexible approach. It applies when you're dealing to ev with everyone, but I would, I would strongly encourage it with your person with MS. You have to know the person, you have to establish your relationship. You have to Try and understand the problem behaviours, as I said before, being aware of their triggers, but also being aware of your triggers. Largely, you can change how you respond much more readily than you can change the behaviour that the person is exhibiting. Try different strategies, and when you come up, when someone comes up with a strategy that works, share that strategy amongst the team so that everybody's using the same strategy. Look for their strengths and abilities. If you make any changes, give them enough time to work. Again, remembering they might have a reduced ability to learn new things. So give plenty of time for a change to be implemented and ensure a consistent approach to care. Particularly, again, if you're implementing a change, everybody needs to do it in the same way and come about it in the same, with the same approach. But we're quite realistic too, and sometimes the symptoms of MS do result in behaviour that is extremely challenging to deal with and beyond what you might have in your repertoire of strategies in the way that you've managed other residents who have challenging behaviour. So then you might need specialised assessments. And there are teams available in each state who can help with a specialised assessment and then some strategies to assist in, in managing those behaviours. So in summary, today we've talked about MS as a chronic incurable disease of the central nervous system, a disease in which the symptoms can vary from person to person and from time to time. We've talked about how MS can cause the premature loss of roles and activities in a person's life. We've talked about medical and some non-medical strategies that are used to help manage MS and the symptoms of MS and that sometimes the symptoms of MS can lead to challenging behaviours and so personalised management plans are needed. So here's another opportunity for you to pause, have a bit of conversation amongst yourselves and have a think about what might you need to do differently in regard to your resident who's living with MS. I hope that's been helpful.
and that you've come up with some ways that you might change your practices or think about things differently or, or go and ask for some further input as to what would be helpful for your resident. Just our last couple of slides with this, to point out to you some other services and support that's available to you. There's a whole lot of support and services that MSL provides from our 1800 number that provides information and advice through to support through the National Disability Insurance Scheme and individual support for individuals. So we have um, MS nurse advisors, we have MS social work advisors that are available by phone to give advice either directly to the resident or the person living with MS or to you as a provider. And, and lots of support and information like I said through our education programs, through our website, through the MS Connect line. Worth pointing out a, a publication that's available free of charge online. So go to our, our website and have a look for MS practice. So there are a range of topics there that might be relevant to your resident that go into a bit more detail about management strategies. And as I said, we are a registered NDIS provider, so if you're, the person that you're working with is under 65, it's very much worthwhile them exploring their NDIS eligibility and what, they can, what they're entitled to under the NDIS. And if it's anything we can help with, by all means let us know. Finally, our contact details, phone number and website, and I, again, I've repeated this a few times, but don't, don't let the conversation stop now. Continue to learn, continue to explore ways that you can better support your residents with MS, and if we can help you with in any other way, please let us know. Thank you.